Michael designed hundreds of buildings and thousands of products. However, his greatest design legacy may be the countless students that he taught who have gone on to become successful architects in their own right, professors and deans. To speak about Michael the Educator, we will now hear from Ted Brown, Susan Conger Austin, Brian Ambrosiak, and David Money. Good afternoon. Like many of us here, I'm fortunate to have known Michael in different ways. As a professor, in the office, teaching together in Italy, as a friend and at times combatant. Although I'm happy to say, despite his persistent invitation, we never played golf. <laughs> Not Michael's strong suit. At Princeton, circa 1980, chain smoking in the studio, Bic lighter on a string stapled to the drafting board. We had our time, dominated by Michael and Tony, usually at odds, and there were the Allens, Calhoun, Chimikoff, Plattis, Peter Waldman, Stephen Harris. VCs, Bernard Schumi and Elia Zangales. David Coffin was lecturing on Renaissance architecture and gardens. Bob Geddes was dean. Jim Sterling, Bob Stern, would pop in for reviews. Hayduck would come to read his poetry, and Peter was somehow always in the air, and sometimes present. The Institute was thriving. <laughs> the Institute in New York was thriving. At Princeton, the Rossi Graves debate was raging, one of the city typological, the other of the landscape always contingent. It was through Michael's lectures that we tried to understand some of the complex languages of the vertical surface, through Cezanne, Métis, Bachelard, Biedemeyer, Morandi. But in the studio, it was always about space and the use of architecture history to inform the work. Today in our mostly academic post-digital debate about autonomy, contingent autonomy, representation, disciplinarity, once again fields and objects figure in ground, one in which Michael's work has returned, I want to mention a very specific contribution of that period, circa 1980, one way we might remember Michael. That is the idea of the fragment and the reciprocity between building and landscape. What did he teach? In the studio, formal structure, spatial diagrams in plan. A week's worth of work would be reduced to six lines, of, a six line drawing on yellow trace, trying to make sense of the mess. At that time in his studio, architecture was to be understood as always contingent. Through drawing, iterative drawing, we were asked to explore a formal and spatial relationships between building and landscape. We learned from his drawings of Fargo-Moorhead, the Crooks House, the Plosek House, discovered Pochet, a new way to draw, understanding thickness not as a result of systems of assembly, but at any scale, mass to be formed and carved to be figured. It was a brief moment, building oscillating between figure and ground. And with it, an embrace of history to advance the project, Villa Madama, Villa Aldebrandini, Schinkel, Melnikov, Alto, Ledoux, Ostland, the drawings of Shepard and Jellico, a Catholic reservoir brought in relationship to our formal experiments, and always understanding building as a fragment in support of a spatial narrative in a constructed relationship to a physical site. Years later, in a restaurant in, in Florence or Rome, Michael recalled a thesis student's preliminary presentation to the faculty. She proposed a site in the rear view mirror. Ralph Lerner, Princeton's dean at the time, 
said to the student, you can't use that site. Someone used that site last year. Michael's retort, put politely, was, that's enough. At that time, he seemed estranged from this institution. But the specter of Michael's criticism has been and will be for me and so many others always present. Intense scrutiny, remarkable formal insight, a host of precedent, precedents, and exquisite diagrammatic clarity. As a critic, he was at times kind, with a sense of humor, but more often tough and demanding. The very best you could ever hope for were the words, good work. Michael, in turn, good work. Remarkably good work. Your insights and drawings will live for a very long time. You once said to me in times of family sadness, use your work to work through the tragedy. Embrace your work. Michael, we won't forget you, your hand or your voice, and we will and must get back to work. Good afternoon. We have all had teachers who have changed our lives. <clears throat> Michael was one of those individuals who helped me see differently, both professionally and personally. I was at Princeton in the early 80s in the three-year program. We were a diverse but close-knit group of 14, each of us struggling to understand what architecture was all about. Michael was our professor in the second year. Now, rumor had it that the outcome of the first assignment, a short exercise he had given annually for almost 20 years, was critical to one's success in Michael's studio. The project was an addition to a house located in Sweden, the Villa Snellman by Gunnar Asplund. You can't imagine the anxiety and the fear of failure. Our future, as we saw it, hinged upon the delivery of a brilliant solution. But the point of this exercise, as I soon discovered, was not one of a brilliant solution based on abstract theories or geometries, but one of history and connection. How does one move through a space? How does one create a, an environment that relates to people and their surroundings? Michael was a passionate teacher. He cared. He was really engaged, critical, yet always encouraging, and always with a sharp wit. On a personal level, Michael had recently returned home from his hospitalization when I came to visit for an afternoon. Here was a person bound now in a wheelchair, talking to me candidly about his life-changing situation with no self-pity. He spoke of his future and woven throughout our conversation was his drive and focus on future work. It was not a surprise to me that a short time later, he began to design objects to make life more dignified for people with disabilities. We have all faced setbacks in our lives, but when I think about that afternoon with Michael, I am still moved. As a practitioner and a professor, I try to impart to my students the responsibilities of an architect, the process of thinking, but most importantly, the principles that Michael instilled in those of us fortunate enough to have known him. To me, that is the living leg legacy of Michael. He opened my eyes, introducing me to the fullness of my profession. And for that, I will always be grateful.
My prayers go out to Michael's family. Per el nostro integnante. My first introduction to Michael was through his design work. I was an undergrad at the University of Virginia and was assigned the Hanselman House as a precedent analysis. From that point on, I had one goal, to attend Princeton and study under Michael Graves. That dream became a reality, and then again a dream. As a graduate student, my late night efforts were not only read by Michael, but by Bermonte, Schinkel, Asplund, and of course, Luc Corbusier, who had always accompanied him. Here was a man who had been raised on a steady diet of modernism, who spent his lunch hours with his dear friend Peter in the basement of the archaeology library, feeling his way through history, studying the canon with the sole desire to be an active participant. To the collections of nouns and verbs that I had already assembled were now added adjectives and adverbs. One particular day, my class was pulled into the auditorium and a single slide was projected. For 45 minutes, Michael walked us through the mechanics of Botticelli's masterpiece. The formal and symbolic aspects of the composition were described through a modernist lens. We came to understand how Botticelli had simultaneously flattened three-dimensional space while maintaining a division between the sacred and the profane. I will never forget that feeling, one of being completely overwhelmed by Michael's ability to distill such enormous meaning from a single composition. This is why it was especially gratifying and equally sad to find myself with 33 second-year Tennessee students in the National Gallery, as is our yearly tradition, speaking to Massimilino de Panacale's Annunciation the day after learning of Michael's passing. I'm certain he was smiling down on us, and as was so typical of Michael, looking beyond my own shortcomings and offering his complete approval. Each year, I spend two days lecturing on Michael's artistic conscience to our incoming first-year students, referencing his quote that's become a central tenet of my own teaching, that it goes without saying what the architect chooses to draw, using his sketchbook as a record of observation, reveals the examination of his artistic conscience. At the end of the lecture, I send Michael blue irises with a short note thanking him for playing such an important role in the development of my artistic conscience. The first year I did this, I didn't immediately hear back from him. I assumed he had been traveling and that the flowers perhaps were not received. Sometime later, a print arrives in the mail, a beautiful painting of the irises in their light blue vase. This was Michael to a T, a transforming spirit who devoted his life to looking to observing and ultimately to discovering. An individual that embodied the Nietzschean imperative, become who you are. When our beautiful princess passed, Michael sent us these simple words. Ella, we will always miss you. Michael, we will always miss you. Good afternoon. First, Mary Kate and men, thank you. Certainly, Michael Graves is one of the most prolific major architects in American architectural history. Perhaps only a few other figures like Frank Lloyd Wright and Frank Furness come close to the number of important projects undertaken, designed, and built. Then when you add in the furniture, and the home objects, literally thousands of designs, you get some sense of the extraordinary output of his practice. But in working closely with Michael over the last five years, a different understanding about his profession, his professional life, has emerged. That understanding is informed by research and interviews about his early career as a young faculty member at Princeton, where he became extraordinarily close, both professionally as a collaborator and personally, as a friend to Peter Eisenman. And in the last year, Michael became enthusiastically dedicated to starting a new school of architecture at Kane University, conceptualizing a curriculum and a pedagogy from scratch to address making good architecture, really good architecture, in the contemporary world. Making that detailed examination of these important formative years at Princeton and discussing his aspirations for a new school at Kane, as he moved towards the end of his extraordinary career, I came to realize just how important education, architectural education, was to Michael Graves. 
for all that incredible productivity in his practice, I now understand that his teaching was a necessary and equal complement to it. Each was a lens for the other. The teaching informed the practice, and the practice contextualized the teaching. I suppose I should have known this much earlier. In the fall of 1979, I was a student in Michael's Princeton studio. Late in the afternoon on the day before Thanksgiving, all of my fellow students had drifted away from our design studio to get a head start on the holiday. The studio was close to finishing as the end of the semester approached. Over the next two weeks, there would be the usual charrette to complete each design, finalize the drawings, make a model, rehearse the presentation speech for the final public jury. But that day before the holiday was the calm before the final flurry of design work, and my colleagues had left early to return to families, provision for the holiday meal, or just catch up on sleep. I didn't have anywhere to go that Thanksgiving, so I wasn't in any hurry to leave. By late afternoon, I had the studio to myself, and I sat on my drafting school and worked to resolve the plan and section on my project. I'd had a crit with one of the junior faculty earlier in the afternoon, but Michael, the primary faculty member, had been excused for the day to make a presentation to a client for a new project. Michael was unquestionably the best and most important teacher at Princeton. His absence may have had been another reason why the other students had left a little early. A little before six, Michael unexpectedly stuck his head through the door. He was back from his presentation and had decided to look in on the studio, even though officially, of course, the course hours had ended. We chatted for a minute about his job talk. It had gone well, when suddenly he pulled up another stool and sat down with me. And for the next hour and a half, in a deserted academic building on the eve of a holiday break, Michael Graves talked to me about color in architecture. It was a time in schools when just about every other project was white. What Michael was presenting to me was radically different from that norm. And I was getting a private tutorial into his latest thinking about architecture and architectural education. His passion, his conviction about making better buildings shone through that afternoon. Some people worry about the style of Michael's architecture dominating at Kane's new school. I think they misread his intentions. What Michael cared about most of all was good architecture, or really good architecture, as he called it. That's what he was after in his teaching and in his practice. Good architecture didn't have to look like his to be good, but it did have to be good. I saw this for myself last summer when Michael and I traveled to China to visit Kane's campus in Wenzhou. In addition, we were hosted for a day by Wang Shu, dean at the Hangzhou Academy of Art. Wang Shu toured us through his latest project, a hotel for visitors to the Hangzhou campus. The building is designed as three separate modern pavilions connected by an undulating trust roof with areas between and inside the pavilions activated to make humane spaces and connect to the larger campus. The style is unabashedly modern, spare yet with wonderfully crafted materials and finishes. It didn't take Michael long to weigh in on the quality. Davy, he said. He had started to call me Davy whenever he was really happy and in a really good mood. <laughs> Nobody's ever called me Davy before. <laughs> Davy, this is really good architecture. He couldn't have been happier. 